Um, and a little bit a little bit about, no worries, a little bit about myself. Um, so I am a military brat. Um, both of my parents actually served in the military. Um, my mom was an air traffic controller. Um, my, my dad, oh, she's brilliant. <laughs> um, and my dad was in infantry. And so um, that really has sparked kind of a love for service in me. Um, my community matters. Um, I think from being a military brat, it teaches you that your community can be anywhere and it can be far and it can be spread wide. But if you cultivate that community, no matter where you are located in the world, you will always have somebody that's there to support you and somebody that has your back. Um, and so from having that kind of sense of community, um, I kind of experienced throughout college, um, you know, people say all the time, if you get to have one friend for more than five or 10 years, you're probably a good person or you're doing something right. And I think about, you know, being in the military and having family and friends like that. It's so rare where you get to go out and experience, you know, I didn't go to kindergarten through college with all of these same people. And so the fact that I still have friends that I have known now for 30 years for 25 years, all because it was important to keep that sense of family, that sense of community, no matter where you're located. And a lot of that comes from being willing to serve others, um, to put others before yourself, um, to serve, to have a servant's heart, um, and to really, really know that you are always going to be a better person by championing, championing for and making other people better. Um, and so that's kind of where my service has come from. Um, so that service now has turned into a desire to really have more of a leadership opportunity and a leadership role. Um, I definitely feel like I have the background, dedication and commitment to taking that leadership and, and really shaping and cultivating a community that I want my kids to grow up in, that I want my mom and dad to be able to be elderly in, um, that there's something for everybody. And that looks like having a safe community for everybody. Um, so by trade, I am an attorney. Um, I focus on child welfare law. I started out um, in general family law and I was miserable, I'm going to be honest. I absolutely hated divorces. It, it just, you know, blew my mind the stuff that people think is important. Um, and so one day a good friend of mine said, hey, why don't you come down to juvenile court serve as a guardian at litem, see if you like it. And I was hooked instantly. Like this is where I'm supposed to be helping these kids out, helping their families out. And so I initially started representing um, children and parents. Uh, one of my very first cases, I represented this young man. Um, he had stolen uh, deodorant, underwear and cologne from Dillard's less than $500 and everybody was like, oh, we are going to have to change this young man's life and throw the book and all of these kinds of things. And it made me think about a story about myself. Um, when I was in high school, um, so I told you my family is a military family. They didn't make a whole lot of money. My parents had gotten divorced when I was in high school. So my mom was a single mom, you know, working two, three jobs at a time. I, I, to this day, I still don't know how she managed to work that many jobs and still make it to every game, practice, whatever. It, phenomenal. So um, I decided I'm going to go down to the Hamricks in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and I'm going to steal these bracelets because my mom can't afford them. I'm going to take them. Get into the parking lot and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, your mom's going to be mortified that you have done this thing. You, how are you going to look your cheerleading coach in, in the face and tell her that you've been doing this stuff? Your band director is going to be disappointed. Your friend, like, why would you do this thing? So I went back inside the hammocks and turned myself in, you know, <laughs> just like I'm giving this back to you. I'm so sorry. And I'm thinking about that story and I'm sitting in court representing this kid who is stealing necessities and he's doing that because he has no community that is supporting him he doesn't have parents that are coming to his football and baseball and basketball mm -hmm. games he doesn't have teachers that have been drilling into him regardless of what your circumstances are you can overcome let's get this work done you know 
be a good student. And so it just made me realize you can represent people in court cases all day long, but if you're not doing anything that affects the legislation that directly impacts what their community looks like, what resources that they have available to them, how they can succeed and be successful where they live, work, play, what are you doing this for? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I I really feel like after COVID and the market downturn and this is just the time. Like we need somebody that's in the Senate that's gonna be passionate about serving people, um, recognizing that this is the seat of the people. It's not my seat. It doesn't belong to any one of us. It belongs to the taxpayers who have elected you to be there. And you have a duty and an obligation to make sure that you are constantly advocating and pushing for the things that they need and what they want to see in their communities. And so that's why I'm here. And I'm thankful again for the conversation and and hoping that I'll be able to do that for them. That was loaded. (laughs) (laughs) That was loaded. And I mean, being that you work in law, I think, you know, that's an excellent attribute um, to have as someone that will be coming into the Senate. Um, I noticed how I just said that someone that will be coming into the Senate. I guess I, we just spoke that into existence. Huh? Listen, I'm um, claiming it. Wash it over. Go me. ahead and claim it. <laughs> Look, go ahead and claim it. Um, what, what, I, help us understand what was the day like when you woke up and said, I want to run for District 35? I want to run for this seat. What, what made you come to this conclusion? I actually. Um, and in a program called Leadership Douglas. Mm. And uh, in that program, we have several different days that you go out and you learn about different stuff about your community. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, I'm a child welfare law attorney. I've been doing this now for several years. Um, I'm very immersed in the community, you know, what the population of people that we serve, what they need, these service providers. And, you know, I'm thinking, oh, here I am, ra-cha-cha, I know all of this stuff. And we sat through a presentation and this young lady came um, and she named off about 45 different service providers, specifically in Douglas County, I had never heard of. And I was thinking to myself, I do this work every single day, and I have never heard of any of these things. How in the world are we getting this information out to the community? And it's stuff that would absolutely reshape what public safety looks like here Mm -hmm. um, in our district. It would absolutely reshape what healthcare looks like in this district, Um, what access to education looks like. And if I'm doing this work every day and I don't know, I know that no one else knows. And that's not fair. And I'm, you know, just on this hamster wheel and running through COVID and watching all of these families keep coming in with the same issues over and over and over. And I find out that there's some woman 10 minutes down the street that you could have had a two second conversation with, (laughs) have access to these services. And I'm like, why is there not legislation connecting people to these services, Mm. dictating what the advertising looks like for these programs, what the minimum income is for these programs. How do we get these programs into the school systems? Like how are we going out and claiming that we want all of these things and to make people better? And there's nothing on the books that is making you do it, telling you how to do it, forcing you to do it. And I just got tired of it. I said, if, if I can either sit here and I can complain about it and do nothing, or I can be a change agent and I can put them anywhere my mouth is, run for this seat and show people what my commitment really is to making a difference in these areas. And, you know, it's funny um, that you mentioned these services that no one know about. Um, We we sort of are still kind of going through something similar out here in South Fulton where, you know, there's issues going on in schools and you find that, you know, there's no connections of the dots where the schools are working with the DA's office and mm-hmm. or the schools are, aren't are working or connecting with, with different programs that can actually help families so that families can um, get these resources, maybe through some social services, because most schools now, some of them don't even have social workers. And, and so we just found this out recently, just, you know, from some meetings here 
And I think it's, it's, it's highly important to have leadership that recognizes the importance of connecting resources. There is a lot of resources out here. I just think that, you know, in today's legislation, which a lot of people aren't from Georgia, and mm -hmm. they find out after they move here that Georgia is a red state. <laughs> like Georgia <laughs> is red, okay, on the right. state level. It may look blue in your city, and it may look blue in your county, but at the state level, it still is a red, it's a red state. And so it does require, you know, a little more heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we do need some very passionate and compassionate leaders um, to take the helm of these, um, these positions to represent us fully. Um, what would you say are the most immediate needs that you want to address if you're elected in your district? So um, initially, I probably would have said education. Um, City of South Fulton, uh, Douglasville, Union City, all of these areas could really use um, a boost kind of through that connection to services and communities that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be my number one thing, expanding our offerings. Um, through education. And when I say expanding our offerings, I mean, making sure that students are aware, like it's okay if you want a path that's different than going to college, this is how we're gonna help shape and mold you. These are the tools that we are going to, to provide to you so that you are able to go and make a livable wage um, in a career that you can be proud of um, I think so many students get disenfranchised because they don't want to go to college and that's fine like that's not the only way to be somebody. Um, I was just with the um, South Fulton um, law enforcement and all of the outreach opportunities that they are doing and all of these programs that they have going on um, to elevate black men to help expand you know their educational opportunities and make them positive productive contributing male members of this society um, and a lot of that's just basically through education if they could get into the schools that would definitely be one the same thing with EMS and the fire department. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that having those different community service providers in the school changes the dynamic of what community policing looks like for you. Um, it makes citizens more likely to actually rely on the police department in a safe and healthy way, but also helps them know how to interact with us. Um, and if we can start that relationship through early education, you know, we're, we're already half the way there with, with trusting and, and rebuilding and reshaping what our communities look like. And I definitely think that the South Fulton Police Department's doing an awesome job of that right now, um, Douglasville's Police Department. And I love to see how all of the different um, police departments and fire departments and chiefs in our district are all really kind of working together to make sure that you've got uniformity across these jurisdictions, which would be my next thing that I would want to tackle, and this is kind of more specific to our court systems, but we absolutely need legislation to address uniformity across the state. Mm. It should not matter if you live in Union City or if you live in Cherokee County, you should have the same and equal access through a uniform filing system. Everybody cannot afford to pay for an, attor an attorney and your access to justice should not be denied because you cannot figure out how to use some complex filing system that exists over here but doesn't exist over there or they're kicking your filings out because they don't match or you know whatever so I would love to see legislation to make uniformity across the entire state to make sure we are all using the same technology the same platforms and the same filing system um I also would like to see more legislation so that we are training our judges so that uniformly you are getting the same legal outcome. It should not matter if I get divorced in DeKalb County or if I get divorced in South Fulton or if I get divorced in Douglasville, um, I could get a completely different outcome just based on what courtroom that I'm in. And that is not fair. Um, the same thing with criminal cases. I should not get a slap on the wrist if I'm in the city of Atlanta and then in South Fulton have you know a five or seven year 
jail sentence. That, that is not fair. That does not serve our community and that needs to be tackled immediately. Um, the other thing, and I guess the last thing that I would really want to start pushing in, in my early terms as Senator um, would be to focus on um, health care um, mm -hmm. and specifically how that crosses over into other sectors. So one of the things that I would really want to focus on as far as crime is concerned is silent crimes. So we have a lot of rape victims that go unreported because they're afraid they're going to get um, a copay or a bill from an emergency room and they don't want to have to go and get that medical treatment. They don't have insurance, all of that kind of stuff. And I don't think people think about how decisions get made um, when you don't have what should be a universal right to all people is access to health care. My crime shouldn't go unreported because I was afraid to go talk to the police first, but on top of that, I can't go and get medical treatment because I have no idea how I'm going to pay for it. So I just stay at my house and, and I do nothing. Um, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and so I would also like to see expanded healthcare offerings, um, particularly for women services. A lot of times our issues, um, particularly for issues like fibroids um, and uterine issues go undiagnosed or untreated because they're not covered by your health insurance, but in the same policy, your husband may be covered for Viagra. That is insane. Um, and so I would like to see some shifts and some changes. And I know that um, we absolutely, along with that healthcare, we need more urgent care centers and we need more hospitals. I'm, I'm so disappointed to see that the hospital yeah. in South Fulton is closing down. We already have a deficit with our ambulance response times um, and with medics. And now they're going to get to you, but where are they going to take you? Um, and so that really needs to be looked at and addressed. Wow, that, that was pretty loaded. There are so many things <laughs> wanted to um, say yes. And, and yeah, I, I, I'm with you on that, um, especially when it comes to the superior court judges right now. <laughs> you are spot on. Um, I just submitted an email. I really feel like we need a, a scorecard because, Absolutely. you know, here in Georgia, the uh, governor can appoint he can make appointments or they're elected in by us, yeah. the people. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to pay very close attention to that election and these judges because here in Fulton County, it I mean, you're right. Depending on the judge is it it, it depends. The outcome can can vary. And that that is why we have so many repeat offenders out right now Absolutely. who are com continuously um committing these crimes. The juvenile, you know, issue that we're having with with the youth getting guns and, and they're committing all these crimes, there is no uniformity. So I really like the fact that um, you are already on top of that. <laughs> um, and you will, you will be working towards um, making some changes. Um, that actually makes my heart smile. It's something that I haven't heard of any other candidate actually mentioning. The other thing is I work in the healthcare industry. And what I have found here recently is I had four female friends that were recently diagnosed with stage three or four breast cancer in a matter of two weeks. And what's ironic is a lot of insurance companies don't cover the hereditary mm -hmm. cancer testing for these women. And I mean, it's just a simple blood test that yep. you would get when you go for your annual visit. However, when you find out that you have breast cancer, then they order the test. I mean, it makes absolutely no, no sense. sense. So if we can make that a preventative measure, along with a, a, a woman's women's wellness visit, we could actually prevent 30 to 40% of women who are getting breast cancer that already had this DNA gene. I mean, the Absolutely. DNA gene is there. It's Absolutely. not going anywhere. We need to identify it though, so that we can prevent, we can, you know, put these women on a path of prevention mm -hmm. where they can get these MRIs and mammograms sooner. Georgia also really needs to mandate 3D mammograms for African-American women to be covered. So just giving you a few, you know, pointers here and some tips as what as to what I see out here in the industry that's very painstaking. We are making decisions based on cost. Okay. Yeah. 3D mammograms do cost an extra hundred to two hundred dollars. African American females, we do have denser breasts, and we should have that mammogram. We should not have the standard mammogram that doctors are offering. So it would be great 
to um, get some efforts towards um, championing those those mm -hmm. efforts for sure. Well, and to add to that, um, with the um, medical recommendations changing, depending on who your insurance provider is, one woman may be able to elect and go um, and have pap smears annually, but because of the new guidelines and your insurance company may only cover you going every other year or every three years. And so the disparity between the woman who gets finding out when she's at stage zero or stage one cervical cancer versus someone who had to wait two years, like that's just, we need a standard of care that is uniform across the board to give everybody the best chance possible at survival um, and at the opportunity to take care of and provide for their family. So we absolutely need um, legislative change in that area. And to piggyback off of what you were saying with the superior court judges, um, as you mentioned, sometimes they are elected. Sometimes if someone retires early or doesn't finish out their term, they get appointed. But the other impact of that is those judges then go on to appoint our juvenile court judges. Oh, so if yes. you don't have uniformity <laughs> in the superior court, you're also not going to have it in the juvenile court too. And that reach. It matters. It, I it mean, matters. it really matters if you have a juvenile court judge who is in touch with what the needs of the community are. Realistically, what does it look like for the people who come before me to live in this community versus someone who I just knew somebody that knew somebody and got appointed? I mean, that's just, <laughs> you know, something that we really need to, to pay attention to. Is this the best scheme for how we get our judges in Georgia? And it may not be. I agree. Um, you and I can talk about this all day. <laughs> um, because like I said, I've gotten to know a lot of the Superior Court judges in Fulton County just by way of, you know, this last election, we actually had to elect a lot of them. And um, it's, it's, in, it's important that we follow their adjudication. How are they, how yeah. are they adjudicating cases? How often are they just releasing um, uh, criminals with felons back into yeah. society? I mean, that is a major, major issue. And if we can get, you know, some solidarity around that, I, I believe we will have safer communities and you Absolutely. won't find these criminals just bopping around from, from Fulton to Cab, to Cab and Cobb, you know, it <laughs> right. be, you, do the, you did this crime, you gave you a second chance, you're on your third, fourth, it's, you know, you made the choice. So it's time to, you know, to spend some time wherever you need to be to think about it and maybe come back as a productive citizen at a later time. But right. let me share some comments with you. Um, you've got some chatty um, participants here. Okay. So, <laughs> so Tanika says, yes, policy changes matter. Absolutely. Early prevention, it is key to reproductive health. I would agree with that. Tanya Martin says, major support for individuals who can't afford college. They have the skills today that can lead them directly into a lucrative position to highlight their credentials. And yes, Whitney, all Americans, regardless of status, should be afforded health care. And Tanika comes back and says, completely agree with getting those 3D mammograms. Yes, <laughs> friend. yes, they are a necessity. Absolutely. And you should not have to choose. If you have to pay $100 over getting one free, it should be the, I would say the standard for African-American women. Just make it a standard for all women. Heck, it's better right. than the original one. Now, I do want to go back to Everyone likes talking about affordable health care. And I have seen, I've actually received a um, brochure from someone who said that they were going to, you know, make sure that all Georgians get affordable health care expand by expanding Medicaid. I just want to, you know, say this, that I think we should look at maybe expanding health care, but not maybe through Medicaid. And, and the reason why I say that is because a lot of doctors are not being reimbursed by Medicaid. OK, right. so so perhaps we can still, you know, meet the goal, but perhaps we open up the exchange where we have affordable health care for all and people can choose what they want. Right. We have Anthem Blue Cross is headquartered here, Aetna, and I believe United Healthcare has an office here in Georgia somewhere. So if we can maybe not monopolize it and have two to three options for people. I don't, and maybe Georgia can subsidize some, some of the costs for those who exemplify a need. I think that would be a, 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 a different option than just trying to give everyone free healthcare. What are your thoughts on that? You weren't, we didn't, you, this one is just really from the topic of what we're talking about now, because I do think we have to stop trying to expand Medicaid. 
Well, and I think I'm actually very glad that you asked that. I think that that's where one of the benefits of being an attorney and having an analytical mind and being able to see the argument from both sides is a definite benefit. Mm -hmm. um, one, all medical care providers are not going to accept Medicaid, period. Period, 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 it just is. And that's okay, um, because I don't want someone to come into my courtroom and tell me you got to do things in this way when I know that there may be some other option out there that may suit you better. Mm -hmm. um, all of our residents don't necessarily want Medicaid. All of our employers don't necessarily want to provide Medicaid. They want to give their um, employer or employees options. That's one of the things, um, as I mentioned, that I've, I've lived a lot of places, one of the most recent places being in Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that they have so many different health care providers um, or health insurance providers so that you can tailor what your coverage looks like for you because mm -hmm. everybody's definition of affordable is not the same. What my definition of affordable may be looks completely different to an NFL football player that brings in six times the amount of money that I do. Um, our definitions are not the same. Um, and so I shouldn't be um, hobbled or handicapped, you know, by someone else's definition of affordable. I should absolutely have options. Now, I say all that to say there are some things that I think that we can do to make healthcare affordable. Mm -hmm. One being capping the cost of prescription drugs, regardless of who your provider is, mm -hmm. period. Um, there is no reason why I should have to choose whether or not I eat today or if I die from diabetes because I cannot afford my insulin. That is ridiculous. Um, we also need to really um, kind of have an overhaul and look at what is the markup, what is the inflation that is being added to different services um, that are being provided to us and figure out what, what, you know, what those things are really costing, how can we mitigate some of that and what does that look like? And that I think is where um, building um, stakeholder groups and um, community-based organizations who have the time and the resources to go out and do the legwork and actually figure out what's needed, what it's going to cost so that we have something palatable to, to provide to these insurance companies and these hospitals and these healthcare places. Because again, their definition of affordable is going to look different than what a community member's definition of affordable is going to look like. Um, and so I think um, to just expand Medicaid and only have that as an, op an option is futile. It's not going to meet the needs of the most. Um, and I don't necessarily think um, that that's the most beneficial way to look at this. Um, and so again, you've just got to look at what those partnerships look like, what those community-based organizations look like, um, and then listen. Mm -hmm. We really have got to start listening to what people actually need. And again, it doesn't make sense for me as a woman to be paying for coverage that includes Viagra treatments or supplements. <laughs> and I'm never going to use that. Um, so, um, or covering, you know, illnesses. If I was a white American living in this area and you're covering like sickle cell treatments, well, I'm not very likely to have that as a disorder, but I may have lupus. Um, and so like, let's make sure that that is covered. And I think if we stop with this one-stop shop, one size fits all that will help work out some of these kinks. I completely agree with you. Um, and I kind of want to go back to when you were talking about the schools, you know, one thing that when I was growing up here and I went to Frederick Douglass High School, we had the, I guess it was called, it wasn't really work study, but as a senior, I was able to, first of all, I learned how to type. So I still know how to type like 75 words per minute. Okay. Like <laughs> nobody can beat me. <laughs> I still got it. Right. And so that was a huge skill. You know, I was able to then um, get a job at the CNN center for an attorney as a secretary. So I, I had these skills at 17 years old. I went to school for half a day. And then I believe back then schools had a partnership. They had partnerships mm -hmm. with local businesses. I actually made money as well. Mm -hmm. So it taught me, it taught me a lot. It taught me how to get a job. Um, I wasn't 
on the track to go to college at that time. I was not college material. I was barely making seats, okay? Um, and so I, I'm that student that I believe you were mentioning earlier where we need to bring those opportunities back absolutely. into the schools and by partnering with the schools because you're absolutely right. We, we are heading into an abyss, I believe, where mm -hmm. we will have so many students vowing and trying to get into college and going to college and getting into debt, but and the what? job, the workforce will have so many jobs, but not enough qualified candidates that have skills. What do you think, you know, can be done, I guess, in state legislation to improve the synergies between businesses? And um, we do have some colleges here in Georgia, universities that actually teach trades. How can we improve um, that level of workmanship between our students, maybe even starting as, as early as eighth grade for those kids who may know or have some type of idea of what they want to do. I mean, you can become a medical assistant for crying out loud or an ultrasonographer. Um, you can get certain certifications and, and still make a pretty decent living for yourself, but I don't think our kids are getting exposed to those professions. Um, in state legislation, I haven't seen any new policies come out about this. Um, what What were your thoughts when you mentioned, you know, when you mentioned that earlier? I think it comes back to the two B's, bills and budgets. Um, we've got to really focus on bringing back some of those things. Um, my sister actually uh, did that when we were in high school. She had the opportunity to become a CNA at the same time. So she went to um, school half of the day, and then she went and got certified to be a CNA. All of that changed when we started teaching to a test. That's got mm. to go. We bless the hearts and souls of teachers everywhere that I know they have a passion. They want to teach their students more than just what is ABC and one, two, three. A lot of the education that you and I benefited from when we were in school was them teaching you how to be a successful and contributing member of the outside world. Mm -hmm. um, there is no reason right now that South Fulton, Douglasville, and Union City all have a deficit in EMS and firefighters when you only have to be 18 for both of those jobs. Why are they not having programs where they can come to the school, students can do their core classes for half the day, and then go start their 90 hours of training? You graduate with a paycheck, you're a contributing member of your family, you have something to do with your time, you're not out participating in crime. You absolutely, absolutely have to pass legislation that increases dual enrollments and trade schools. Um, th there's just no, there's no other way to do that, um, but to make sure that our budget allows for schools to, our state budget allows for schools to be able to provide these opportunities in schools, and we have got to work with educators and education committees to figure out how do we make a robust education system that eliminates this mass focus on teaching to a test so that they can do what they love to do and what they have been trained to do, which is to make us educated, contributing members of our communities. Um, and as you said, there's the, the trade schools are already here. We have a shortage of welders right now. And there are at least two trade schools that I can think of that both offer welding programs. You come straight mm -hmm. out of high school. Um, there was a kid, um, I was out talking to some of the constituents in the area and there was a young man who took um, uh, dual enrollment to get an automotive certification. And he came straight out of high school, got a job at Lexus is making $50,000 a year to work in the oh, automotive program. Imagine how game-changing that is yes. for starting his career path. That's how you get into a trade where, um, you know, back in the day, people were like, oh, I started from the ground and now I'm here and I make six figures. That, that, that's where it starts, coming out that's with a valued skill and then building on that over time, over time, over time. So making sure that students have access to dual enrollment programs. I, also would love to partner with organizations like, um, I'm not sure if you have um, heard of this organization. It's a nonprofit that's in our district. It's called Beyond the Front Porch. And their sole goal and focus 
is to take children beyond their front porch and bring back field trips. How do you know what is here, what is out there, what you can be, what you can participate in if no one has shown it to you? And I think we have gotten so used to stigmatizing kids and their families when they don't want to go to college or when they want to go out and get a trade. We've got to stop that. And the way to do that is to be able to get them out into society, get them into the real world where they can see, you know, this wonderful craftsman that's over here. I mean, if you think about it, we're not going to have seamstress. Where, where are you going to take your clothes to have them tailored if we have no seamstress? We're not going to have people that um, are cobblers and, and repair shoes if no one's teaching that trade. Who's going to fix your car if no one wants to go to automotive school? Um, so we've got to stop the stigmatization of kids who want to go those career paths, kids who want to work with their hands. Um, and so I think, like I said, we need bills to increase access and availability. We need a state budget that allows for these programs to be in the school. And then we've got to get into the schools and open up partnership opportunities to bring field trips back. And I, and I can't, I remember, again, I have to remember when I was in school, we used to take that trip in the fifth grade to DC. Mm -hmm. that's, that's like gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Our, my I have a 13 year old and he did not get that opportunity. Of course, You're talking about DC. We can't even get these schools to let the kids go downtown to the Georgia state Capitol. <laughs> I mean, it is really mind boggling. And I, and you, your access to these opportunities should not be tied to your individual ability to take and expose your kids to these mm -hmm. things. Um, it's a right. Education is a right. And education looks like more than just what occurs in your classroom. It's from right. going to the zoo. You know, what about the child that that sparks that they want to be a zookeeper, or an animal trainer or a zoologist, you know, the kids that want to go to the aquarium and they want to be an oceanographer now, you know, people that go, like you said, to DC and now they've decided I want to be in politics. And when they get there, they also have to see people that look like, look them. like them. Yes. It is mind boggling to me. If I'm elected to this seat, I will be the only black female attorney in the Georgia state Senate. There will only be two black attorney wow. females in the legislature at all. One is in the house of representatives currently that, I mean, that is, it's 2022. Like, Kids need people that look like them in these positions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let me read a few more of your comments here. Let's see, Tanika and Tanya, you get the award for being the most engaged here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's let me let me back up here. Uh, Tanika says she loves that idea about dual enrollment, uh, Whitney. It opens so many options um, for individuals. And Tanya says that her company has a program called the New Collar Worker, where they focus on students who can't afford college, but they currently possess STEM skills and can move into IT roles immediately wow. after graduating from high school. That's amazing. So that's pretty cool. Um, and she also said, yes, Whitney, this is so critical. They need <laughs> to see representation. Um, Listen, it is, it is mission critical for our kids to see us represented, it, represented at, at all levels when it comes to politics. Um, locally, most often they will see elected officials that look like us, but at the state level, not so much. So I, I want to um, basically take my hats off to you for wanting to you know, step up and champion this campaign to make a difference in your district. Um, what, what would you say are your last and final words as to why they, your constituents should vote for Whitney Kenner Jones? I would hope that they would take away from this conversation um, that the passion is real. Um, I'm not here to, to fill a seat. I'm not here um, for name recognition. I am here to work for you. Um, again, as I mentioned, when we open this up, I'm a servant by nature. I have a servant's heart and I'm here to, to, to serve the community. Um, the other thing is I have children. 
my mom lives in this district. My sister lives in this district. My brother-in-law lives in this district. We're here. Like, I, I see want, them here. <laughs> I want this community to be a community where they can grow and thrive. And, and I really think that we have to have somebody in this seat that has a passion and a love for this community. Um, I, I hope to still be here when I'm 115 years old on my rocking chair in a safe community that takes care of me the way that I want to take care of them. Um, I, I, I definitely feel like I have the energy. Um, and I think, as you mentioned earlier, this is um, I'm going to call it a purple state. We're going to be a little positive. We, we're, okay. we're creeping in there. <laughs> But you're going to have to have some energy. You're going to have to have um, resilience. You are going to have to be relentless to get the things done for this community that we need. Um, and I'm all of those things. I am a bridge builder. Um, I am very comfortable with being uncomfortable. I'm in court <laughs> every single day with people who do not like me and do not want to see things my way. And at some point, we got to figure out how to get past that because it's not about me and it's not about you. It's about the people that we are here to serve. Um, and we just, we absolutely don't need continued more of the same. I feel <laughs> like the passion and the energy that I'm going to bring to this seat is definitely something different. It's something new and we're going to work together to push Georgia forward. I love it. Love it. And I love the idea of, it, of us being purple. <laughs> That is definitely a, a better, a much better spin on, um, you know, where, where we have been for quite some time, but what else would you like for the constituents to know? Like, do you have some events coming up or they, you have some meeting greets? Um, do you want to share your, your, your platform? Where can they find information out about you um, on your website? Um, I would love our um, followers and the and the folks on tonight and all the, the remainder of the community to know we can be found on the internet at WhitneyKennerJones.com. Um, we are also on Facebook and on Instagram. We're on Facebook under um, Whitney, um, Whitney Kenner Jones for Georgia and on Instagram at um, elect Whitney Kenner Jones. Um, and so I'm hoping that, oh, I think my cousin Vincent just logged in all the way from Texas. I'm sorry. Hey, Vincent. <laughs> um, that's what I say. Your community, you never know where they're going to show up all the way from Texas um, and, and still supporting. So I appreciate that. But that's yeah, awesome. they can definitely find us on social media. They can find us on Facebook. We are going to be planning a fundraiser at the end of the month. So please stay tuned um, because that'll be an opportunity for you to come out. Out and meet me in person. I would love to get your um, questions, talk to you about what you want to see in your community and what you need in your in your neighborhoods and what you would like um, for your schools to look like and all of those things. And so I'm just here to listen. And um, there are several events coming up in the city of South Fulton um, that are hosted by other organizations, and I'll be there. Um, so I'll have my name tag on Whitney Kinder Jones <laughs> for Georgia State Senate. That District 35. So, um, but follow us on Facebook and Instagram and on the website for the most up to date information. Okay, awesome. And the infamous Tanya Martin says, <laughs> Whitney definitely has my vote. Elect Whitney Kenner Jones. Um, so she definitely is passionate about supporting you, as I'm sure some of some of the other constituents and voters are here as well as your family and um you all you all should receive a copy of um this zoom so that you can share it with your friends and your family um to encourage them to get out and vote early bird vote early voting i believe starts in may so may we don't second. have May 2nd. Yeah. Yep, so early voting starts May 2nd. And I do want to let you know that I actually will be attending an event with the city of South Wales and police on April the 30th, where I didn't tell you this, but I'm a gun instructor. And so <clears throat> for women, I, I do teach uh, women only and for safety reasons. And so we are actually having a gun safety awareness class um, for young males that we'll be teaching on that day. Um, hopefully, if you're not busy, you can stop by and 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 their their parents will be there as well. So hopefully you can stop I by. I definitely and will definitely stop by. And I actually have um, 
a teenage brother um, who I would love to bring to the event. So we'll definitely see you there. And we'd also love to have your endorsement. That would mean the world. We want you to know that. And we want safer communities to know that. <laughs> Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, you have some more. Um, ooh, yes, all these comments are popping in. Love the passion, Whitney. You will do an incredible job and appreciate your priorities. That was from Lindsay. And Sharon Owen says, very excited for your journey. So proud. Great platform and great ideas. Lenora says, wonderful conversation. Excited about what you about what you are and will do when you get elected. I think that's a great way to um end our conversation on tonight. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed um, speaking with you, Whitney. You come with a burst of energy, fresh, bright ideas, and you are unafraid. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, those are the characteristics that's needed um, in the Georgia state legislation. And um, stay tuned for my endorsement coming soon. <laughs> and um, I wish you all the best. Don't Guys, don't forget, you got to get out and vote. Early voting starts um, May 2nd, you said? Yep, May, May 2nd. 2nd. All right. And then the actual election day is May 20. Is it May 24th? May, yep, 24th? May 24th. So keep those dates in mind, um, but try to do it early if you can. And again, Whitney Kenner Jones, any last final words you have for, for the um, participants today? That That is pretty much it. If you don't get out and vote, then you can't complain about what happens to you. So make sure that you beat the feet all the way to the polls. And I hope to have your vote on May 24th. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us all the way from Texas. You get the award for being the furthest away. <laughs> um, and thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope this was helpful, impactful, insightful, and informational and gave you some more insight into who Whitney Kenner Jones is. Um, until next time, I hope all of you stay safe and talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.